today we're going to talk about um, cancer immunology. And I want to, before I start going into the details of cancer immunology, I want to first um, just make sure we're on the same pages about a few details of cancer because those details are going to be important for our application and understanding of cancer immunology. Um, and so there are three terms that students sometimes like to confuse a little bit and sometimes will conflate together. Um, two of those things are transformation and mutation. So cells can undergo mutation in DNA following exposure to mutagens or because of replication errors or whatever. All mutations are not necessarily bad. Some mutations don't lead to a change in an amino acid. Some mutations might be advantageous. People have this idea in their head that mutation equals dead. But in fact, mutation may equal no change, or mutation may be a good thing. Yeah, mutation could lead to something that's problematic, but mutation could also, evolution-wise, give you blue eyes or make you an X-Man. And we all want to be X-Men. Um, so remember that mutations are not necessarily a bad thing. Um, however, if that mutation occurs, in some gene that influences something like cell division or apoptosis, sort of cell cycle control, things like that, then our cell may become transformed. Because that cell is no longer going to be controlled by normal um, cell growth or death processes. This could happen as a result of mutation. This could happen as a result of viral infection. But every mutation and every viral infection do, does not lead to transformation. It's only a situation where we have a mutation or an infection that influences some growth or death process of the cell. So students sometimes see the word mutation and immediately think cancer is going to happen, but there are plenty of types of mutations that are outside of these types of processes. When we think about cells that are used in the lab, like the THP1 cells that we used in the lab, those cells would be referred to as transformed cells. Typically, for a cell to become a transformed cell, um, that cell needs to undergo multiple mutations, not just one. Um, so our cell might first acquire some mutation that maybe makes it proliferate a little bit more than others. It may then get a second mutation that allows further changes and on and on and on until we finally get to that sort of tumor. This is your textbook's view of that. These are two views of the same process from some other textbooks. And so you can see that for example, our cell at the beginning might be predisposed to proliferate rapidly. Um, a second one might make that cell divide even more rapidly. Um, the cell might not actually be transformed until it gets that second mutation because a lot of these controls on growth and death are pretty redundant, so it might take a few hits before the cell is really out of control. Then we might have some kind of structural change. Then we might have um, further uh, mutations to have uncontrollable division. What you can see is that our first mutant cell um, can divide and only some of its progeny might have that second mutation um, and on and on. Uh, so it's not as though we're going to have a homogenous set of cells um, in this area all with this large group of mutations. There's probably going to be a few cells here. Oftentimes, some of those early mutations are in things like repair pathways, which allow the cell to pick up more mutations quickly. The other thing to realize is that three different cells can take, or not just three, lots of different cells, three in the example, can take different pathways to become tumor cells. So it's not like there's an order of genes that always has to get mutated. There are a set of genes that can get mutated um, and so every tumor is going to be a little bit different in the case of which mutations that has acquired 
the order that it has acquired them in um, and sort of its history and how it has become that transformed cell. Sometimes I get a little uh, picky uh, when we talk about transformed cells um, and um, because sometimes students will talk about that, those transformed cells as cancer cells or cancer in a dish. And not a fan of that at all. <laughs> um, yes, in the case of our THP1 cells, those were cells from a patient's tumor that came out of that patient. However, if you injected those cells into me, I would not get cancer. Those cells are transformed. They can grow indefinitely in a dish, but that doesn't, but just because a cell is transformed does not make it cancer. There is a separate process called oncogenesis that occurs that allows a cell to become a cancer cell. So transformation is going to occur in cell culture, um, and that allows a cell to grow uncontrollably in culture. But for a, ce a cell to grow uncontrollably in an animal, there are additional types of changes. Transformation just means you kind of grow indefinitely in the lab. But if we actually have to get around sort of anatomic and physiologic barriers, that's a much harder thing to do. So a transformed cell is not necessarily oncogenic. To be oncogenic, we need some additional changes besides alterations in cell uh, survival and division. Division and survival. Um, and we usually talk about the things that are needed um, to allow this to happen as the six hallmarks of cancer. Um, and so the cell does need to be able to proliferate a lot. So this idea of replication constantly to expand numbers is important. Avoiding death by apoptosis is important. And those are important for both transformation and oncogenesis. Um, but these cells generally are going to need to be able to develop their own blood supply. They're going to have to induce blood vessel growth because if you have a mass of cells, you need to be able to bring nutrients and oxygen in it. That's not really important if you are, live in a tissue culture dish. But if you live in an animal and you want to become uh, a tumor, um, that's going to become really important. Um, our cells are going to need to ignore um, growth inhibiting signals as well as make their own growth signals. The idea there is, for example, they might make their own IL-2 to feed themselves. Um, these cells also have to have the ability to potentially leave their site of origin to invade other tissues, um, which is the process of metastasis. That involves um, a lot of uh, action with the extracellular matrix. Um, and modifying the matrix as well as cell movement issues. Again, those are probably not that important in culture, um, but will be important if you actually want to form a tumor in an animal. Um, you will see a little bit about why I am making this distinction um, a little bit later. So there are a number of different causes um, or things that seem to be associated with cancers. Some of them are different types of environmental factors. Um, some of them might just be bad luck in genes or in replication errors or replication errors that your mom had that you got or something like that. Um, you can also think about you know, all sorts of environmental uh, and lifestyle exposures like your UV light and your smoking and all of that. There are also some pathogens that can lead to cancers. And this helps me segue to a rather important question for us. And um, I will admit that this topic is sort of an interesting one for me, given sort of the timing of my immunology training. Because if you look in your textbook, or you look in any immunology textbook right now, you will find a section on cancer immunology. And it will tell you all of the great things of cancer immunology. When I started graduate school, cancer immunology was definitely a little bit fringe. There were absolutely professors in my program who were not shy about saying that they didn't think cancer immunology existed. Um, and now your textbook is like, cancer immunology, totally a thing. And so to me, it's always a little bit interesting that we went from this like, eh, I don't know, to like so obviously a thing um, very quickly. 
So I'm gonna present to you a little bit of the question part of this, of the why my professors didn't think it was a thing and how we became convinced that it was, because I think that that's gonna help us think about some of the issues that still need to be solved um, in this field. Um, and so you might think about this, if we were thinking about this exact uh, topic, you know, back in the day, we might say, well, okay, why are we talking about cancer in an immunology class? Why do immunologists care about cancer? And one reason is sort of shown on the right-hand side of this slide. It's also shown on this slide as well, which is that there are a bunch of pathogens <laughs> that can lead to cancers. The most famous one that you think probably of the most is something like human papillomavirus, HPV, that causes cervical cancer. And so if we can think about immune responses to these pathogens, then we can start to combat these cancers. And so a lot, there are many cancers that are pathogen in origin. All of the ones that are shown here are viral. Most commonly, these are viral in origin. And so you can kind of get why immunologists care about cancers that are viral in origin. Like, that makes sense. And another reason why immunologists sort of care about cancer is that when we do treatments for many different types of cancers, we do a radiation and a bone marrow transplant. So most cancer therapies mess with the immune system. So immunologists care about bone marrow transplants and radiation and chemo wiping out the immune system and requiring a bone marrow transplant. On the right-hand side of this, you can see a list of tumor types that typically um, involve some type of bone marrow transplantation. So the fact that in many cancerous therapies, we're messing with the immune system, it's a pretty obvious way that immunologists care about cancer. Um, and the other reason why we can say, yeah, it seems to make sense that immunologists care about cancer, is that there are lots of cancers of the immune system. If you were to rank different tissue types in the body, in terms of how frequently we see cancers of those tissue types, you'd rank skin way up at the top, which makes sense because skin is in, like, in association with UV light and in lots of mutagens. And if you may, did that ranking, you'd find a lot of tissues of the body that happen to be I exposed to potential mutagens, exposed to outside effects. And so you just kind of find a lot of like barrier tissues right up at the top. But you'd also find immune cells right up at the top, sort of way more than they are necessarily exposed to mutagens. The reason for that is because we so frequently can see errors in VDJ recombination. All of our immune cells, as you've seen throughout the semester, are actively, or at least all of our lymphocytes, are actively recombining DNA and have the potential to have errors in that process where other cells do not. And so, in fact, we can see um, on the left B cells at different stages of B cell development making some type of error and leading to a variety of different types of B cell tumors, all because of that genetic change that's happening in the B cell. One of the most famous things that happens sometimes is that sometimes when the Ig heavy chain is being rearranged, we have our two pieces of DNA that have been cut apart, and sometimes the, they join back in the wrong place. We have something called a chromosomal translocation, where this piece of DNA that's been broken does not go back onto the yellow chromosome. It goes back onto a different chromosome. We see a piece of that different chromosome added onto the yellow chromosome, and what ends up happening is we take our nice, awesome promoter for the Ig heavy chain that's in front of the Ig gene, and we put on this other part of this blue chromosome. Um, the blue chromosome happens to have a, a mitogen or a, a gene that's involved in cell proliferation called MYC, um, and so we get cells that suddenly have a um, very um, strong promoter in front of a gene that's involved in cell cycle. And so we push that cell into cycle. Um, this is seen, actually, this is a pretty frequent chromosomal translocation that's seen in a, a variety of cancers. Um, 
that's all happening because of these VDJ recombination errors. And so all that's great and all of that makes perfect sense. But the problem comes in when we start to think about other types of cancers. So yeah, the immune system cares about immune system cancers. That's obvious. Does your immune system care about breast cancer? Does your immune system care about skin cancer? What about all of those other tumor types? And for a really long period of time, immunologists were like, no, definitely not. That's, that's crazy talk. Your, your immune system does nothing to, with any of those tumor types. Why, based on what you know, might an immunologist assume that the immune system doesn't do anything to those types of cancer? Yeah, Malik. They're all self. So the idea was the immune system does not attack self cells. And so all of these types, so you know, yeah, viral cancers we do something about because there's a foreign antigen. But a, a, you know, random mutation breast cancer, that's a self cell, your immune system isn't going to do anything. And that was the dogma for a really long time. Um, And people started to sort of think a little bit more about that. Um, first, in terms of thinking about how long it takes for some cancers to occur. Um, we can see how many doublings it takes before a tumor is even visible or leads to the death of a patient. There's a long period of time before that tumor gets to 10 to the eighth cells. So what's going on during that time where we're not gonna be able to diagnose that patient? And tumors seem to take a really long time. We don't tend to see a huge amount of cancers in our patients until those patients get older. The incidence increases in older patients. And so there's also this time aspect. And so there's sort of this question of, well, what's taking so long? Why is this process happening? And we can make a lot of arguments about that. But this, do, this will be something that ties in. Um, and some immunologists did histology of different tumors. You can see um, a breast carcinoma and a, a melanoma here. The red arrows point to tumor cells in both cases. You can also see there are some cells that are pointed to by the yellow arrows in both cases. And those cells are lymphocytes. And what you will notice is that both of these tumor types, which are non-immune tumor types, are full of lymphocytes. Look at how many lymphocytes are in this skin cancer. So that's the tumor. This is all lymphocytes in the skin. You know, this is our tumor. This is the breast cancer. These are all the lymphocytes in that area. And so this made people say, well, wait a minute. If there's a ton of lymphocytes there, Maybe they're doing something. Maybe something's going on. Why are the lymphocytes hanging out around the tumor if they're not doing anything? The other big reason why people started to second guess that idea that the immune system did nothing about cancer um, was when we started to think a little bit more about immunodeficiency. Some of this was the result of um, AIDS patients. Because we see many AIDS patients who have opportunistic infections um, with different types of pathogens. But there are also a number of AIDS patients who suffer from cancers when they are immunodeficient. When their T cells are gone, they start to suffer from a lot of different cancers. Some of them are viral, but some of them are not. We start to see more and more cancer types um, in some of these uh, AIDS patients. And so that made us think, well, looks like people who don't have an immune system seem to get cancer more often, so maybe the immune system does something about cancer. Around the same time, people were doing a lot of experiments with immunodeficient mice. This included the skid mice, um, which have uh, mutations in the common gamma chain. This includes a mouse that has mutations in DNA repair pathways. It also includes nude mice. And if you just take those mice and have them in your mouse facility, and do an experiment for a week, whatever. 
If you have those mice and you let them sit on the shelf in your mouse facility for like a year, almost all of them are going to die of a nasty cancer. Like they get really, really, really gross looking cancers. Um, and so again, these mice are all immunodeficient. They're missing part of the adaptive immune system. And they kept coming, everybody's mice around the world kept coming down with these gross cancers. And so again, it led to this idea of, well, OK, so if you don't have an immune system, it seems like cancer gets worse. So that, again, might make us think that the immune system is doing something um, about cancer. Um, and so people started doing experiments like the one that is shown here. Um, so we can take a mouse. And we can give that mouse irradiated tumor cells of a particular tumor type. Here it is the red type of tumor. If we then inject actual cells of that red tumor, and we will use cells that have oncogenic potential, not just transformed cells here, um, the mouse seems to actually reject that tumor. Um, if we use a different type of tumor, the mouse doesn't reject. So it, we can see specificity in the tumor rejection response that looks a lot like an adaptive immune response to this tumor. This mouse is making an adaptive immune response to red tumor because it's been sort of previously immunized, where it's not making this response to the blue tumor. We can also see um, some examples of experiments that look like this. So we can start with some mice that we treat with chemical carcinogens to induce some type of tumor. We could then transplant um, that uh, tumor into a similar mouse, and the tumor is going to grow. But if we take CD8 T cells from our mouse with cancer, give, it into the tu give them into the tumor recipient, those CD8 T cells can kill the tumor, the tumor's gone. Similarly, um, when, if this cell recovers from its cancer, we can put in new tumor cells, and again, it will reject that tumor. Again, as if the immune system was the reason why that recovery happened, and as if the immune system, specifically the adaptive immune response, is responding to these types of tumors. Um, and so people. From these types of observations, the field of cancer immunology really took off. When you look at this, and when those old school immunologists look at this, you might imagine that they would have an important question at this point. What question is that old school immunologist who previously said cancer immunology doesn't exist. What question are they going to have at this point? Yeah, Emilio. What's the antigen? Yeah, what's the antigen? OK, so you're showing me that adaptive immune responses can happen, but these are still self cells. What the heck is the antigen in this case? And the antigen is something that is still, you know, people are working on a little bit. One of the reasons why I showed you that each tumor cell has sort of a unique pathway to becoming a, that tumor um, is to help indicate that each tumor may have unique antigens. So I'm going to show you kind of the general classes of antigens that we see in tumors. But um, I can't say that like every time you have X kind of cancer, it has X antigen. And every time you have Y kind of cancer, it has Y antigen. Because all of our tumors sort of have a unique history that got them to the point of being tumor. Um, but there are three broad types of tumor antigens. Those three broad types can actually also be subdivided with two names. So one of them is listed here as TSA. The other two are listed as TAA. Um, a TSA is a tumor-specific antigen. And the idea with a tumor-specific antigen is that in our normal cell, we have normal cell proteins. For our 
cancer cell to have become transformed and then oncogenic, that cell has to acquire some mutations. Those mutations, of course, change the gene, but they also lead to changes in the protein. And so perhaps this mutant protein can now be a foreign antigen. We haven't done selection against it in the thymus, so this altered, mutated self-peptide can now be a new antigen that is unique in this tumor cell. So a mutation generates a new peptide that can be presented. That's called a tumor-specific antigen. Um, the TAA stands for a tumor-associated antigen. Um, and so you can see that, you could guess from the words, a tumor-specific antigen is only found in tumors. That's the mutation that's only found in tumors. A tumor-associated antigen is often found in tumors but could be found somewhere else too. There are two types of tumor-associated antigens. One of them is shown on the right. When we have a cell that is transformed, it may make different amounts of proteins uh, in that cell. And so instead of making one pink squiggly, this cell makes six pink squigglies. <laughs> And that changes the amount of proteins, uh, the amount of pink squiggly protein that is presented on MHC class 1. So we can have overexpression of a normal protein, and perhaps that overexpression will be enough to give a stronger stimulation to T cells. And we will see that self protein acting as a self antigen because of its overexpression. The other type of tumor-associated antigen, TAA, um, has to do a little bit with sort of general developmental biology. So if you recall, your genome has 20,000-ish genes. Each cell of your body does not transcribe all 20,000 of those genes. Each cell of your body transcribes the ones that are, it needs. So the skin cells transcribe the skin ones, skin genes, and the liver cells transcribe the liver genes, et cetera. There are some genes that are only transcribed during embryonic development because they are important for helping you develop as an embryo. But once you are no longer developing, you don't need them anymore. And so you don't ever express them again. Sometimes in a cancer cell, we can see genes that are usually off get inappropriately turned back on. So here we can see that originally our cell was making pink protein and blue protein, but it might start inappropriately making black protein instead. This might be one of those proteins that's normally made during fetal development, but the cell is going to lose its ability to regulate which transcripts it's making. So it's going to start making these other things, these embryonic genes. And we might now see presentation of those embryonic genes where we didn't before. Um, and so we could have that inappropriate uh, production of embryonic genes. Um, these two figures show some examples of this. Um, so at the top, you can see, yeah, sometimes there are tumor-specific antigens that are just from the virus or that could be just from mutations. We can also see a number of different situations where overexpression of a known self protein is associated with that tumor type or um, some proteins that are involved in differentiation stage are associated with some tumor types. Um, in this uh, table on the right, um, you can see that our patient, we were looking for the amount of two embryonic genes being expressed in samples from a number of different patients. The, at the top, you can see one called AFP, alpha fetal protein. And in people who have alcoholic cirrhosis or hepatitis, so liver problems that are not cancer, they don't make that fetal protein. But if they have a liver cancer, suddenly they start making this protein inappropriately. And at the bottom, we can look at another antigen. Um, and we can look at people with other types of disease states versus cancers and see that a higher percentage of them are making these fetal antigens than are people with other types of disease states. Uh, and so these antigens may be unique 
to uh, cancers. Um, the, this type of information has led us to realize there are probably more than six hallmarks of cancer. This figure from your textbook sort of indicates eight hallmarks. I usually talk about seven. Um, so I'll kind of say something quick about the other one, but that's OK. So we have the same six um, hallmarks of cancer that are very important to allow a cell to become an oncogenic cell. Um, and those are probably happening because of things like genome instability. But we have realized that in fact, to fully form some type of tumor, our cells also have to have this seventh aspect of being able to avoid the immune system and evade the immune responses. So you might look at the data I've shown you before this, and you might say, OK, great. So then why does anyone have cancer? If the immune system does stuff about cancer, why the heck do people have it? We should all not have it. And the reason is because cancers are able to uh, evade the immune system. And the seventh hallmark of cancer that we have really been able to describe is this evasion of immune control. Yes, there are also some metabolism changes. I'm not going to talk about metabolism. And this has led to the um, proposal of a theory called the cancer immunoediting theory. I'm going to show you the cancer immunoediting theory on this slide. Um, and the next slide to give you a couple of different textbooks' views on this process. And so what we have realized happens with our cancer cells is that cancer cells arise or mutant cells will arise in a tissue. And by and large, those mutant cells are going to be eliminated by the immune system. Those mutant cells have picked up a mutation or two are getting eliminated by the immune system. They may also have progeny that are better able to replicate or better able to get mutations because of a repair defect. And eventually, more variants of that. Cells that have acquired three mutations instead of two mutations are going to arise. So variants are going to start to arise. Um, that are going to be able to start to evade, uh, avoid the immune system a little bit better. Um, and so we're going to have a little bit more of a back and forth battle. So at the beginning, the immune system is totally winning. And cancer is being kept completely under control. As more mutations are acquired, we are going to get to equilibrium, where um, the uh, cancer is going to be at sort of an equilibrium with the immune system. We're going to be getting some new cancer cells, but we're also going to have some immune control. Um, so the first phase was elimination, immune system wins. Then we have this equilibrium phase. In the end, the tumors may acquire even more mutations so that they are finally able to escape immune control um, and uh, actually lead to problems. What we have realized here is that there are very likely extremely frequent transformation events happening in your body. You're getting sort of like one or two cell cancers all the time. And your immune system is cleaning them up. It's only when one of those further mutates to get around immune control that you start to have some type of problem. And this ties back to that issue of how much we see cancers in patients who are older. It takes a lot of time for these cancer cells to acquire the mutations to avoid immune control. So you know, right now, I may have some sort of microtumor, but my CD8 cells are going in and killing it. It's only after many more years might that cell figure out a way to get around my CD8 T cells. And this is the way that your textbook shows the same thing. So at the beginning, we have healthy tissue. Um, because of carcinogens, viral infections, genetic predisposition, we may have some cells that are transformed. Um, but then we are going to have those cells get uh, eliminated by sort of immunosurveillance, by just traditional immune mechanisms that we've talked about with responses to TSAs and TAAs. Um, and we might be protected 
from that exact cancer again. But as we get more mutations because of the genetic instability of those cells, we're going to start to see those cells persist um, longer term. Um, if those cells further mutate, then they're going to start to escape um, and actually lead to the t what we're used to thinking of as cancer. Yep, Emilio. Absolutely. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about vaccines and things like that um, in a bit. Um, so Emilio says, well, so if you just got rid of all the transformed cells, that'd be great. Here's the problem. Um, which cancer are you going to have in 20 years? Which, which TA, which, what is the TSA that is going to be on your cancer in 20 years? Which vaccine would you like? <laughs> right, you don't know. There's no way of actually being able to predict that that in your cell, gene 73, or protein 73 is going to get a glycine in it, and that's going to, like, <laughs> and so, yeah, in theory, if all of these cancers were homogenous, yes, absolutely. But because there's so much heterogeneity, it can be very hard to predict in advance what you would vaccinate against. So in the case of the viral tumors, where we know it's HPV, it's really easy to vaccinate against HPV. But if we don't, if we have this huge long list of tumor antigens, it's really hard to make a vaccine against every possible tumor antigen in the whole world. So that's your issue. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, it would probably depend on a little bit on the specific details and what kind of cancer we're talking about. Um, I can imagine reasons why yes, and I can imagine reasons why no. Um, so it's a little hard to answer that. <laughs> um, so one part that is implied here is that tumors have the ability to evade the immune system at this third phase in the cancer immunoediting th theory. Um, if any of you downloaded the slides before 1040, I changed them. <laughs> so you're going to see one slide different than, you're, than you saw in a bit about this. Um, because there are a few mechanisms by which tumor cells evade immune responses. One of them is shown here. Um, typically, a normal cell is going to be presenting antigens on MHC class 1. That cell will be killed when it presents those tumor antigens on MHC class 1. Um, that is going to allow selective pressure for progeny of that tumor cell that have reduced MHC class 1 expression or even no MHC class 1 expression. And so typically, progeny of the tumor cells with a lot of MHC are going to get killed first. Those with reduced MHC will get killed later, and we'll eventually have selection for cells that are expressing reduced MHC class 1 down to potentially no MHC class 1. Yes, Molly? Why would that be bad? So what's going to be the problem? So if we have a, our cell completely lose um, MHC class 1, what kind of cells might get to it? Who's going to be Molly's phone a friend? Oh. NK cells, exactly. So now we might make these cells susceptible to NK cell killing. If you recall, NK cells had two different kinds of receptors that we were talking about. One of them was the inhibitory receptor. What were the other NK cell receptors? Anybody? Bueller? No. So one was inhibitory, and the other one was activating. So we've also got the NK activating receptors. Remember, we need some sort of NK activation ligand to turn our NK cells on. Well, 
at the beginning, our tumor cell, because of its uh, rapid replication, because of all of the ways it has changed as a transformed cell, will probably uh, express some NK activating ligands like MYC, which are made by stressed cells. And some of those early cells are going to get killed by NK cells. But another selection is that those cells will often lose the NK activating ligands. And so our tumor cells will also lose things like MYC. Um, in some cases, we see soluble MYC formation, so it even blocks the NK cells from coming. Um, to avoid NK recognition. So we can see similar types of evasion of NK cells as well. Um, so we can see originally T cells are going to recognize tumor antigens. The cell may reduce its MHC presentation in order to avoid immune detection. The cell might just stop making that tumor antigen. If the cell has, all, has gotten to the point of uh, getting to evade the immune system, it probably has acquired quite a few mutations and doesn't need that one protein anymore. And so the cell may actually stop producing the tumor antigen. Um, we also can see situations where that tumor cell may start to turn on the production of immunosuppressive proteins. And so that tumor cell might turn on something like PDL1 or TGF beta to turn off any immune cells that come by. Um, and that was the, the slide that I added was this one because it shows uh, a little bit of that. So um, sometimes that tumor cell will make a lot of cytokines or cell surface molecules that are immunosuppressive. This is very, very, very common. This happens in pretty much every cancer. And so in our later stage cancer patients, the T cells that could do the job are all turned off. They've all been immunosuppressed. The tumor cells sometimes also secrete extracellular matrix proteins in order to actually make a wall between them and the immune system um, and create a physical barrier so that they can't be killed. We can also see the loss of MHC. Um, we can see changes in uh, antigen. Um, sometimes we can actually see the tumor antigen getting presented without costim and getting energy. Um, it's all the same kind of stuff that we saw before. Um, and so these are all the ways that eventually our tumor cells are going to be able to avoid the immune system. And so in any situation where our, you know, our patient is going to the clinic to have a cancer treated, that cancer has gotten to this stage where it is now avoiding immune, immune responses and avoiding immune detections. Um, and this is that seventh hallmark that we have to see for these cancer cells. Um, one other thing that I haven't really mentioned, um, and this is a little bit gratuitous um, that I'm mentioning it because I feel like it, um, is I haven't really said anything about how the innate immune system is involved in this whole process. Um, within the past year or so, people have really started to think about that. And so things like how damaged DNA might play a role in inducing innate immune responses um, has been a hot topic of study. And so how the innate immune system might be playing a role in this um, is still uh, of current research, including down the hall in my lab. Um, so these are just a few of the major papers that have come out. There are even more uh, that um, are starting to address how the innate immune system might be playing into all of this stuff. Yep, yeah, Emilio. What about uh, in terms of detection? Does uh, the cancer have to be past, yeah, past the immune system for it to be detectable? Well, so if we, we go way back, Um, when a tumor is first visible on x-ray, it's 10 to the 8th cells. When a tumor is first able to be felt, it's 10 to the 9th cells. So there's that whole process between being one mutant cell and being 10 million mutant cells. Um, and so most likely, yeah, the evasion is all happening before that cell, before that's detectable, um, in the process of going from 1 to 10 to the 8th. Um, so, all that's great, um, but we also might ask the question, okay, can we use the immune system to combat cancer? We know that there is some relationship between cancer and the immune system, so can we use all the things that we know about immunology 
in order to combat cancer. In the case of the viral cancers, the answer is, uh, yeah, duh. <laughs> um, and so we can have things like the HPV vaccine, um, where we can vaccinate patients um, with this subunit vaccine uh, made of HPV proteins um, that is able to induce a very high level of anti-HPV antibodies. Um, the first uh, HPV vaccine that came out had uh, protection against 70% of cervical cancers. Um, more recent ones have that 70% of cervical cancers as well as 90% of genital, genital warts. Um, some that are even more recent than what's listed here have a few more serotypes and have more effectiveness. Um, so in the case of can we use the immune system to treat viral cancers, uh, yeah, um, kind of makes sense. But we also might wonder about doing therapies for other types of cancers using the immune system. So even if we have a patient who has some type of tumor where the tumor has actually gotten past the immune response, the tumor has sort of gotten around immune control, perhaps if we use everything we know about the immune system and we sort of, you know, get the immune system on steroids, really make that immune system strong or extra on some, wet, some level, we can actually get the immune system to actually kill that cancer. And we see that in a number of different situations. So your textbook actually puts together a whole bunch of ways that we use the immune system to combat cancer in this figure. Um, so there's number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five. Um, and I'm actually going to talk through these individually in a little bit of detail, but they are all covered in this figure on 19-8. So before I go into some of the ways that we use the immune system to combat cancer, let's just take a second and think about how do we treat cancers normally, not counting the immune system. What are the ways that we treat cancers in, other, in patients, and what are sort of the cons of those? Why do we even need a new way to treat cancer? Why can't we just use the ones we already got? Yeah, Molly. Okay, so we've got chemotherapy. Um, chemotherapy is basically using some type of chemical um, to uh, treat our cancer. It makes you feel poorly, it makes you lose your hair, um, it makes you lose your immune cells. Why does it do that? Yeah, um, Alina. It's killing the rapidly dividing. Exactly, so we're using some type of drug to kill rapidly dividing cells. And cancer cells are rapidly dividing but so are um, cells of the GI tract and cells in the hair follicle and other cells in the immune system. And so that's why we have all these side effects and the patient feels terrible. What's the other big way that we treat cancers? Yeah. Surgery. Okay, we use surgery. What's the problem with surgery? You cut up a bunch of, well, it's expensive. You could cut up a bunch of stuff that could be healthy. It's invasive. You can get infections. Uh, also, if the tumor is metastasized enough, you can't get it all out. Yeah, or you also, even if the tumor hasn't totally metastasized, you have this problem of the margins, where how do you know where the last cancer cell is and the first good cell is? How do you make sure you get every last cancer cell? Because if you don't get every last cancer cell, they're just going to start rapidly dividing again and come back. But if you cut too many good cells, then you're going to remove the patient's ability to do stuff. And so there's also this problem of how do you do that surgery? Um, we also can see radiation, which is, again, inducing mutations in the DNA to stop rapidly dividing cells. One thing that all of these issues have in common is sort of their breadth. You know, they're hitting a really broad set of cells. And ideally, what we'd love to do is we'd love to narrow it down. We'd love to go from hitting all rapidly dividing cells to just the cancer ones. And in a lot of ways, this is similar to what we saw with autoimmunity. Um, and allergy therapies. Right now, a lot of the therapies we have immunosuppress the whole immune system. And what we'd love to do is shrink that down and make that more targeted. Um, and I've heard this be related to using an atomic bomb to weed your garden. <laughs> like, yeah, it gets the job done, but it has some collateral effects. Um, and the reason why this is important to point out is that one of the 
most important key features of the immune system, particularly the adaptive immune system, is specificity. And the thing we're looking for in these therapies is specificity. And so that's why so many people really want to work with the immune system in cancer. We know that it does something against cancer in the first place, and it has this great benefit of specificity. So if we just fig could figure out how to harness all of that, it'd be awesome. Um, the first way that people did this was by taking different antibodies and linking them to the chemotherapy chemicals or radioactive molecules, with the idea being that then we could deliver the chemotherapy drug or radiation directly to the tumor cell. Here, you have to know the antigen against which to uh, have your antibody developed, but we can see a number of different situations where we have uh, patients who are treated with um, antibodies that are coupled to chemotherapy agents, antibodies that are coupled to radionucleotides, or even just FABs that are coupled to toxins. So we can effectively, instead of delivering radiation or chemo to the whole body, deliver it just to the tumor cell. Once we started to do therapies like this, people thought a little bit more and said, well, wait a minute, antibodies themselves can lead to the death of a lot of pathogens. And people realized that we can, in fact, deliver antibodies against specific tumor antigens and allow NK cells to do the job for us. And so, in fact, we can simply infuse antibodies against particular tumor antigens and allow those tumors to uh, get killed. And so there are, uh, for example, a number of different tumor types have an antigen on them called CD20. CD20 is on many B cells. It's actually on most mature B cells. Um, but it is very highly expressed on certain types of lymphoma and leukemia cells. And so we can use an antibody against CD20 called rituximab um, to block and kill all of those CD20 positive cells. Um, there are also some other types of receptors, one called VEGF, um, that is pretty frequently targeted because it's overexpressed on a number of cancer cells. And so we can just use NK cells to do the, the job of killing as well. Um, we can also use antibodies instead of as sort of activating antibodies, but as blocking antibodies. So we could take an antibody against CTLA-4 and infuse that antibody so that we never get our CD4 cells turned off, so that we never get that cell that's responding to the tumor from getting uh, turned off. We never get it suppressed. We stop that evasion phase. Never, we never get the immunosuppression that usually happens. Or we can use antibodies against PD-1 or PDL1 um, in order to, again, stop that suppression that usually happens in the late phase of these immune responses. So in our patient who has a tumor um, that the immune system is not doing anything about because um, we have basically turned off the T cells. The tumor has started being immunosuppressive and making immunosuppressive molecules. We can add these antibodies and basically try to turn the T cells back on and allow the T cells to start acting against that, that tumor again. And this is called checkpoint inhibition. Um, and it won the Nobel Prize this year. Um, so, uh, these are the same drugs that we have. The idea is that our CTL is going to be exhausted or will have been actively suppressed by that tumor cell. By using these antibodies, we might turn that cell back on so that it can now start to combat the tumor that it could not combat before. Do you have a question? Okay. So why do you ask that question? What's your question really about there? Mostly the drug side effects and like compounds. So, so Molly's looking at this and Molly's saying, well, isn't this going to be kind of messing up your immune system broadly? And uh-huh. These drugs do have side effects. And these drugs do lead to, in fact, not uh, uh, basically what they lead to is 
overactive immune responses. And so you might start to see a little bit of autoimmunity coming in because you're turning on so many T cells. In fact, your textbook has a really nice description of the side effects of these drugs um, written out in a really good way. Because you still are, here you're not going to hit every rapidly dividing cell, but you're still gonna hit a whole bunch of T cells. So you've gotten narrower, but you're still not as narrow as you might like to be. Um, we have, people have also thought about different mechanisms of making tumor vaccines. One way of doing this will be to take a particular tumor um, and make and study that tumor and find out what its antigen is. We can then induce T cells to that antigen, or we can in fact put that antigen into a vector to induce immune responses um, so that we can deliver those things as a vaccine. One of the most uh, famous ways that we often think about doing this is that we'll take our patient, we'll surgically remove the tumor, and we will study that tumor to find out what the antigens are, or we'll just take those tumor cells and some immune cells from the patient and culture them and try to get an immune response happening in the lab. Once we've figured out what we need to do here, we can take the active CD8 cells and inject them back into the patient. Um, this is commonly done for a particular type of prostate cancer where there's a very uh, clear antigen. Um, there's an antigen, PAP, that will be fused to a cytokine and put on dendritic cells from, that have been harvested from our patient's blood, so we don't have to worry about rejection issues because they are autologous dendritic cells. These dendritic cells will now be matured because of the cytokine, will produce the antigen of interest, and will infuse them back to the patient. So now we have dendritic cells able to turn on T cells that could potentially kill um, the patient's tumor. Um, we also can think about doing different types of dendritic cell vaccines where we might take uh, the patient's uh, dendritic cells out, transfect them with antigen, maybe transfect them with B7 or IL-2 to make them really good antigen presenting cells so that they can activate tumor specific T cells and get the T cells to go in and kill those cells, those tumor cells. All of these are really promising, but you also can see that they are all great examples of sort of this idea of precision medicine in that in most cases, each patient is going to have to have a personal vaccine des des uh, designed for them. We're going to have to take your tumor out, figure out what your tumor antigens are, and figure out how to make you make an immune response to it. And so this is very individualized therapy. It's very expensive therapy. Um, but it does seem to have some promise. One of the other really famous um, immune cell therapies that's out there is known as CAR cancer therapy. Um, and CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor therapy. Um, to start out with, we have a patient who is a cancer patient. And that pa uh, we collect some blood cells from that patient that will include T cells. Um, the first ever patient who this therapy happened on is that little girl up there. Um, you can find her in the news all over the place. Um, so we're going to take the T cells out of our patient with cancer. And we're then going to do gene therapy on those patient's T cells. Once we've done the gene therapy, which I will tell you more about on the next slide, we take our modified T cells and put them back into the patient, is the big picture view of this. Our patient um, has a tumor with a sp known tumor antigen. And so what they have done is they have used immunology knowledge to design a receptor that will bind to that antigen. It's not a normal T cell receptor. It actually is the heavy and light chain variable regions from an antibody that binds to that receptor. But it's been fused to signaling domains from CD8 
um, CD3 zeta, and in more recent times, some other signaling domains. So we can get T cell signaling, even though this isn't a T cell receptor, and make these T cells we've pulled out of the patient respond to the antigen we want them to respond to. Um, so this is how that whole thing looks now. So they've put parts of the CD3 um, cytoplasmic domain, parts of CD28 cytoplasmic domain, and they've been able to recapitulate the entire T cell signaling um, cascade right off of those receptors. Um, in particular, our patient um, had a, um, an antigen on the tumor cell, CD19, which is on many different tumor uh, uh, leukemias and lymphomas. Um, it's also on B cells. Um, and so when these T cells were put back into the patient, basically they just did gene therapy and added in a gene encoding this new receptor, this new chimeric receptor that was never before seen in nature. These T cells could bind to that receptor signal and the T cells would be activated to kill the tumor cells. Um, this worked beautifully. That little girl is still alive and it has worked in a number of different patients. Um, she had a lot of problems immediately after the infusion because this, these T cells actually killed all of her B cells. She had massive cytokine storm and only because of very quick therapy in the hospital were they able to deal with all of her cytokine imbalance issues. Um, but she is now cancer free and doing great. Um, so this is CAR T cell therapy. Um, this it was the first ever FDA approved gene therapy in the United States um, called Kimria. Uh, it was approved in 2017. Um, it is also exceptionally expensive. Um, and there are lots of uh, discussions one can read about the ethics of the cost and why it costs so much and sort of details on that. There are also new generation versions of this that people are trying to make where, for example, the CAR T cell might have multiple different receptors so that we can start to have that T cell not bind maybe every B cell, but only the B cells that also have a second receptor that is present on tumor cells and so that we can have more control. Your textbook also has this great figure of a bunch of the different modified versions or different generations of CAR T cells, one of which is called truck. <laughs> um, and uh, pretty recently, people actually showed that you can put these same chimeric antigen receptors into NK cells um, and get uh, therapeutic benefit as well. <laughs> 